Hi, it's Dwyer. It's September 30th, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, briefly here, I'm going to play catch up. I know we talk a lot about boxing, and this is a boxing video. But uh, let me talk about a couple of uh, sports events that I haven't mentioned before that really have hit me, uh, that to me really deserve your attention. Shohei Otani in the American Major Leagues became the first man to go 50-50. Right, folks? It's astonishing. Let me just say, he was playing for the Angels, then he moved over to the Dodgers. L.A. is high pressure already for athletes. Here's a guy who is moving, you know, from one team to another team in Los Angeles. He gets the big contract. What does he do? He handles the pressure. Folks, he does the unprecedented, right? Just understand, Bobby Bonds was 30-30. His son, Barry Bonds, became the first 40-40 guy in National League history. Right? Understand, it was so shocking that Barry at one point that year got a standing ovation in Dodger Stadium. And Barry was a giant. Right? Let me mention Jose Canseco, the first 40-40 guy in history in the American League, he was in Oakland A. You know, at no time did I think 50-50 was even possible. And the thing that makes Otani really interesting is the base running. He's a technician. He's like Lou Brock. You know, you saw Ricky Henderson, and you knew Ricky's jersey was going to be dirty by the third inning. Right? Because Ricky, if he got on base, he was a leadoff hitter. He was going to try to steal second. And you knew, head first slide, Henderson looked fast. By contrast, Lou Brock, the goal standard before Henderson, running the bases, Lou Brock looked smooth. Right? Lou Brock, don't get me wrong, both men were fast, but one guy didn't look fast. One guy looked fluid. That was Lou Brock. Understand, Shohei Otani, you don't realize how fast he is. This is a 6'4 guy. This is a slugger guy. He looks like a slugger. But yet the guy is fast and smooth on the basis. I don't get the feeling I got looking at Jose Canseco, where Canseco looked like a Bo Jackson type athlete. And you thought, wow, this is one of the best athletes I've seen. With Otani, like with Lou Brock, you know, he ends up with steals, and they look effortless, right? Even when the catcher is on it, even when it's a close play. So this guy has the whole thing working. He already is singular because he's a pitcher who throws extremely hard, right? Then, of course, he's the hitter. Oh, and... Unlike Babe Ruth, who was a pitcher who became a hitter, Otani has also become a base stealer. Right? This, to me, is one of the big stories of our time. He barely missed the uh, Triple Crown in the National League. Right? Understand, the guy he lost the batting title to um, won his third batting championship. Right? Otani is within four percentage points of him. Uh, just simply outrageous, really deserves a look. This is one of the best seasons any athlete in any sport uh, I know of has had during my life. That's how big it is. Let's talk about boxing. Let's talk about a fight I haven't discussed enough and I should have. Because as I see it, this is one of the performances of the year by a guy who continues to surpass my expectations. 
I didn't talk about the fight before it happened, but Chris Billum Smith's victory over Richard Reakpour. Oh, folks, please, look at the tape. I've put the highlights in my favorites folder today. Understand, uh, Billum Smith is a good short puncher. He knows how to shift his weight. He, you know, knows how to throw an uppercut on guys who are foolish enough to hang close in the pocket with him. But, you know, my feeling was that he wouldn't be able to fight a fight against a guy who could move a little bit, who could keep him outside. Now, Billum Smith continues to get better. Quite frankly, I didn't expect him to beat Lawrence Acoli, who, by the way, is now the Bridgerweight champion. Well, here he is in, it was a rematch. Reakpour had beaten him the first fight, although the first fight was close. But he's in against Richard Reakpour. I'm convinced that Reakpour must have been looking at him during the fight and thinking to himself, this is in the rematch. Who is this guy? Right, Billum Smith takes a step back. This is the guy who's dominant when he's up on you, leaning on you. He takes a step back. He actually maintains a cushion for stretches of the Reactpour fight. He has Reactpour straight right hand timed. Right, folks, this is a dangerous fighter. Right, let's just say I expected Reactpour to beat him. What happened instead was a methodical destruction of Reactpour. I mean, you knew by the 10th round that Reactpour needed a knockout to win the fight. And the reason it's noteworthy is because Billum Smith is showing you a skill set that I haven't seen in prior Billum Smith fights. I'm accustomed to the guy who is trying to get by your jab so he can get inside and make it rough and tumble. I'm not accustomed to the guy who has you guessing on whether he's going to come inside actually takes a step back, is showing excellent defense, is blocking your shots, is countering you from the outside. Now, he's one of the champs in the cruiserweight division. Folks, he looks like a champ. What I want people to understand is right now at Bridger weight, one weight class up, a guy he beat, Lawrence Acoli is trying to get a fight against Richard Reactpour. In other words, there's a possibility. The only thing stopping that fight, by the way, is Kevin Lorena, the mandatory, who wants the shot. But just understand, there's a possibility that two guys that Chris Billum Smith beat in defending his cruiserweight title Right? In fact, he beats Okoli, takes Okoli's title, and then defends it against Reactpour. Those two guys might be fighting for the Bridgerweight crown. And understand, Bridgerweight is not close to Cruiserweight. The gap between Bridgerweight and Cruiserweight is like the gap between Light Heavyweight and Cruiserweight. Right? So, you know, let me just say... Chris Billum Smith deserves to be on your radar. His victory over Reactpour, to me, is one of the most significant victories any fighter has had in the entire sport of boxing over the last 12 months. Well, let's shift it up here, because how you look at things, the angle at which you look at them, really does matter. Now, could you imagine if Canelo's only loss was to Dimitri Bevel, right? It's not. We know Canelo lost to Floyd Mayweather, right? But let's pretend for a moment that Canelo's only loss was to Bevel. Then let's say Canelo decides to lead the division, gains not seven pounds, not eight pounds, not 10 pounds, not 20 pounds, but he gains 25 pounds. He goes all the way up to cruiserweight. And believe it or not, he picks up the title there. Right now, just imagine 
only loss on his resume is to Dimitri Bevel. And after that loss, he has picked up a title 25 pounds above where he fought Bevel. Folks, that fighter exists. He's a southpaw. More importantly, he's what I call a ringer. He's one of the sport's few switches. In other words, you see the guy, devastating body puncher. He's one of the best body punchers in the entire sport of boxing. He's such a good body puncher that if you look at the compu box for his fight, his one loss to Dimitri Bevel, you're going to be astonished by the number of body shots he landed. Right? I don't expect Baturbiev to reach Bevel's body like this guy, Zordo, Gilberto Ramirez did. Right? Understand, Ramirez is supposed to be Chris Billum Smith's next opponent. Right, folks? That's going to be an interesting fight. Understand, if you look at Zerdo's fight against Joe Smith, you're going to be astonished by his jab. You're going to be looking at his jab and you're going to be thinking to yourself, wow, this is one of the better jabs in boxing. Right? Understand, Zerdo has height, has reach, can live outside. He doesn't need to come inside. But yet, when he comes inside, folks, he's a premier body puncher. The question, though, and it is a big question, this is a question we ask in Terrence Crawford fights, is which Chris Billum Smith is he going to be fighting? Right? I'm just telling you, there are rounds in that Richard Reactpour fight where I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, wow, I, Smith looks really good. You know, I'm thinking, wow, I, I didn't realize Smith could handle himself so well from the outside. Right? And I've seen several Smith fights. Well, let's go one step further. Folks, Cruiser, wow. The winner of the Chris Billum Smith, Gilberto Ramirez fight, is supposed to fight the one guy in boxing. Folks, there's only one. The one guy in boxing who reminds me of the Ali who fought Cleveland Williams. In my last video, I talked about the most talented heavyweights, the most skilled heavyweights I've seen in history. And my conclusion was that the Ali who fought Cleveland Williams was the best heavyweight at a moment in time in history. There's one guy in the sport of boxing who reminds me of him. Right? You know, ridiculous legs, hard to find him. You don't view him as a puncher, but yet he's stopping guys. And there's a certain nastiness to him. Right? That Ali had. Understand that famous picture where Ali's standing over Liston? Ali's yelling at him to get up. That's what Ali is saying to him as Liston is on the canvas, right? Ali had a nastiness to him, right? He's fighting Ernie Terrell, famous fight. Terrell, of course, kept calling him Clay before the fight, and he's yelling at him, what's my name during the fight? Well, there's a fighter who's as nasty as that, who moves like Ali, who throws combinations, who has fast hands only, believe it or not, like Otani Bats, like Gilberto Ramirez, this guy's a southpaw, right? Like Usyk, this guy's a southpaw. His name's Jay Opataya. Now, let me just say, I personally believe Opataya is wasting his time at Cruiserweight. Right? I'd like for Obataya to go to heavyweight. 
the coordination gap would be jarring. In the earlier video I made on heavyweights, I purposely put the entire fight, I have links to fights of the various heavyweights, I put the entire fight between Larry Holmes and Jerry Cooney. And Jerry's a bad man. I mean, understand, Jerry Cooney destroys Ken Norton. Right? Jerry's a bad man. And understand, in that fight, it's brilliant because you see Holmes pull away in what was a competitive fight. Folks, there's another Cooney fight that deserves your attention. It's Jerry Cooney against Hall of Famer Michael Spinks. Right now, understand, Spinks was a light heavyweight who came up to heavyweight. Beat Larry Holmes twice. He fights Jerry Cooney. Folks, unlike Larry Holmes, and Holmes was agile. Holmes skilled. Holmes could get up on his feet and stuff like that. But Holmes is cautious. He's judicious. He lets his jab do the talking against Jerry Cooney. Michael Spinks, who looks awkward, comes in and is just throwing combinations. He's letting his hands go. His operative theory is, look, this guy can't match my coordination. If I throw enough volume, this guy who's a slugger who's not defensively blessed is going to fall apart. Jerry Cooney gets stopped in something like the fifth round of the Michael Spinks fight. Now, my point to you is the heavyweight division has errors. We're still in a big, clunky heavyweight era. Right? Think Martin Bacoli. Think Zhili Zhang. Let me point out, these guys are highly skilled. Right? I'm not saying that these guys aren't highly skilled. But a lot of their game is to land big shots on you. They can be low volume. Right? Deontay Wilder. They could be painstakingly low volume. But of course, they feel they're the bigger man. They feel you can't hurt them. They feel they're going to land eventually that it's really a slugfest, not a 12-round boxing match. In fact, for these guys, going 12 rounds is a disappointment. They want stoppages. Right? Think about Anthony Joshua. Right? These are big men. It's about getting stoppages. Now, I'm just telling you, could you imagine a J.O. Pattaya, Martin Bacoli fight? Are you sure that that fight would not look like Jerry Cooney against Michael Spinks? What about a Jili Zhang, J.O. Pattaya fight? Right, folks? Usyk's in his late 30s now. I'm hoping Opatai realizes, okay, I need to give the fans something here. Right? If I lose my unbeaten record, fighting a great, a guy who was undisputed at cruiser, who became undisputed at heavy, if I lose a spirited match to Alexander Usyk, who is not the kind of guy who's going to come out seeking a KO, particularly not against a guy he can't find in Obataya. Right? I believe a boxing match breaks out. If I'm Obataya, I ask tough questions. Is my hand speed as fast as U6? Right, folks? I'm just here to tell you the answer is yes. Can I deal with U6? coordination? I believe the answer is yes. Now where it gets shaky is, let's face it, we're in a Southpaw era. That would be Southpaw against Southpaw. And you and I know whatever the world thinks 
Southpaws have a hard time against other Southpaws. They're accustomed to fighting right-handed fighters. So I, you know, the rumor is that Obataya was in training camp with Tyson Fury. You're never going to get a straight answer on this. Obataya was let go early. Could it be that Obataya was too fast, too slick, moved too well for Tyson Fury? Folks, there's a distinct possibility. This, Tyson Fury had a hard time with Steve Cunningham. Right, so just understand what's happening right now at Cruiser. Uh, where, you know, you have a Cruiserweight champ who's already beaten the Bridgerweight champ. <laughs> uh, where you have him fighting a ringer. Right, folks? Ramirez's last fight, many of you here thought that the muscle-bound guy who he was fighting against was going to be too much for him. You have to look at Ezra Charles tapes to see a guy pull off what Ramirez pulled off. Ramirez at times, against a slugger, puts his head on the guy's chest. I'm not kidding. Because he realized that, unlike Billum Smith, where that's suicide, right? Billum Smith can lean back and hit you with an uppercut right here. Ramirez realized that the guy he was fighting didn't have that uppercut. The guy he was fighting had a hole in his offense. The donut was right on his chest where Ramirez rested his head. Understand, I'm telling you, Ramirez has one of boxing's better jabs. He could have been outside. Understand Ramirez was outside and inside, winning rounds. The fight wasn't close. So a Chris Billum Smith, Gilberto Ramirez fight, folks, that's boxing of the highest order. The winner fighting Jay Obataya, my God, that's going to be an interesting fight. Right? I would take, and I admit, I've underestimated this guy for several fights, but I would take Obataya over. Chris Billum Smith, who has blown up my thought process on his game. In other words, I saw him, I didn't think he was that great, and then of course he's done what fighters do. He's beaten excellent fighters. <laughs> he's, you know, you beat Okoli, you beat Reactpour, you're a legitimate champion. Right? But my point to you is, look at Ali against Cleveland Williams, right? This is a Cleveland Williams who's rough and tumble with Sonny Liston over two fights. Right? This is a big cat who, you know, would get in the pocket, would mix it up with sluggers. And Cleveland Williams against Ali is just walking around. First round and a half, he can't even corner Ali. He can't even get close to Ali. Ali's just dancing around it. Are you sure that wouldn't be the case if a J.O. Pattaya fought an Anthony Joshua? Right? Are you sure? To me, smart guys understand whether it's Michael Spinks whether it's Roy Jones. Let's remember too, James Tony goes up to heavyweight, stops Evander Holyfield. Right? Smart guys understand boxing is about angles, hand speed, coordination. If you're a gifted boxer, you can neutralize a several pound weight gap. Right? I'm not saying anybody can take AJ's punch or Geely Zhang's punch or Martin Bacoli's punch. I'm not saying that at all. But they have to find you to deliver it. Right? Bacoli, who is a long range hooker, would be interesting because Obataya would have to get between Bacoli and his hooks. Right, folks? I think he'd be able to. So pay close attention to Cruiserweight. 
You're about to have a series of fights. I'm hoping a promoter throws enough figures at Obataya. Robotaya then says, okay, I'll fight Usyk. Folks, that's a glorious fight. Because understand, Usyk would be at risk because Usyk isn't a knockout puncher. So a boxing match would break out. You need to ask yourself, who in the sport knows with certainty that they could outbox Jay Obataya? I believe the answer to that is no one. Right? I think an Obataya Canelo fight would be interesting because I don't believe Canelo, the smaller man, would be able to find Obataya, the bigger guy. Right? Movement is a great thing to have. Movement timing. Nastiness. Let's see how Cruiserweight unfolds. Understand at this point, Chris Billups Smith has exceeded my expectations so much that while I'd be surprised if he were able to beat both Ramirez and Obataya, I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> because I've seen him beat Okoli. And Okoli's holding on for dear life in that fight, folks. And I've seen him beat React Poor. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. Uh, obviously, a lot's happening in other weight classes. We're about to get Bevel against Perturbiev at 175. All I'm saying is pay attention to 200. Right? Pay attention to Bridger weight. By the way, Akoli's been calling out Deontay Wilder. Do the math. Most of Wilder fights would have qualified for the Bridger weight division. Right? Understand, um, you're going to have the heavyweight division go on a diet because some of these guys are going to figure out that they'd be better off with better coordination than pounds. Right? I'm guessing you're going to have a new wave hit the heavyweight division. Right? I keep telling people Richard Torres is a name to watch in the United States. And Torres is a better athlete, quite frankly, than most current heavyweights. Right? Things run in cycles. You go from Jess Willard to Jack Dempsey. Right? These giant guys rule the rules, then they fall by the wayside. Before you know it, people like Rocky Marciano are ruling the heavyweight division. Smaller guys, right? Marciano, of course, beats Joe Lewis, right? Much bigger guy, right? Ezra Charles beat Joe Lewis. Floyd Patterson was not that big. Food for thought. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.